I have a disclaimer before we get started. There will be no lollipops given out with my sermon. Jody threatened to leave earlier if I didn't give him one. Unfortunately, the youth ate all of my one lollipops. Um, but today we're, we're going to talk about leadership. Um, and we will talk a little bit about lollipops, but those won't come till the end. And, and I, I started off, and one of the things I did this week, I asked a bunch of my friends, Christians and non-Christians, what the first name they thought of when I asked them who they thought of when I said the word leader. And so we got lots of different answers. Some from the Bible, some from politics, some from other religions. Barack Obama, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, Winston Churchill, George Washington, Martin Luther King Jr., Superman, Gandhi, Jesus, Paul, King David, Moses. And that, that list goes on and on and on. Everyone thought of some great leader. No one said, like, my Uncle David or my cousin Jim. It, it, everyone, when they thought of leader, they, they thought of these. Whether you agree with them as leaders or not, they certainly have some of the qualities of a leader. And these people aren't, aren't just your... your, your I, Everyday leaders. These were influential people. They're Nobel Prize winners. They're great people from history, from religion. But that list is intimidating. I start to think of all those people, what all those people have done in their life, and it's ridiculous to think of what some of them have accomplished. And I don't think anybody here would doubt that these people are leaders. But I think many of us doubt that we are leaders. If you've ever tried to recruit more leaders for anything, you know these phrases really well. I'm not a leader. I could never do that. That's outside my comfort zone. I would rather die than get on stage. It didn't go for me. It didn't go well for me last time I tried to lead. Somehow, throughout the years, we have made leadership into this thing that in order to help with something, you better possess the same skills and qualities as the greatest leaders in history. When I look at that list of names, I don't see Alexander Nelson fitting in with that list of people. And I'm willing to bet a majority of you feel that way too. So we're, we're going to start with some scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 12 to 19. It should be on the screen too. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would, make it, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong in the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. For if the whole body were an eye, where would this sense of of hearing. If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So our first point, we are all a part of the same body. Okay? You, me, Pastor Jody, the nav board, all of us, we are a part of the same body. There's not some magical extra limb of leadership that some people get to be a part of. As Christians, we are all part of the same body, the same church. And, and then I, I, I hear these things. But Alexander, I, I'm this, or Alexander, I'm that. I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm too whatever. 
great. You are who you are. God has made you in his image. If you're too young, Timothy, one of the, uh, one of the writers of the, the books, First and Second Timothy, has some great encouragement for you. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And this flows really well into a verse from Luke. Luke 22, verse 26. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. There's a whole lot right there. Okay? Set it an example in your faith, your love, your purity. He doesn't say you have to be a great public speaker. He doesn't say you need to be incredibly organized. He says you need to love. It doesn't matter if you're young. And guess what? The greatest among you, the older, the wiser, you should be like the young. You've lived an amazing life. And you've had this great opportunity to practice these things of love, the way you conduct yourself purity, and the things that you can show people. You're not disqualified because you're too old or too young. That, that's, that's not what the church is. We are one body. Jesus' disciples, uh, when that verse in Luke comes up, they're arguing amongst themselves who is the greatest. And then Jesus tells them that. That if you want to be the greatest, you need to serve. You need to love. These are the things that he asked of them. And, and, but I, I hear, Al Alexander, you're, you're a pastor. You get to talk to people about Jesus for a job. And I do. It's awesome. But like I said earlier, that's not, I don't get some magical extra limb on the body of pastoralship or leadership or whatever. I'm just as much of the part of the body of Christ as you are. Okay, I, I, I don't mind coming and speaking on stage. I'm not one of the people that would rather die than talk to you. But that's okay. I, I'm, we're not asking you to all to come preach a sermon. But we are asking you to serve. And so we're going to continue on with our scripture from 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 12, 21 to 26. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. And on these parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greatest honor. And our underpresentable parts are treated with great mo greater modesty. Which of our more presentable parts do not require? But God has still composed the body giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may, may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another, that if one member suffers, all will suffer together. If one member is honored, all of them rejoice together. And so no part of the body is more valuable than another. Okay? What James is doing up there on projection is just as valuable as what I'm doing here on stage. What the people in the nursery are doing with our kids. Honestly, I, I act like that can be a lot harder than talking to people. <laughs> Depending on who you have that day, sometimes children's ministry is wild. Okay? But we, we say these things, but you need to believe it. It's easy to fall into a self-destructive trap of believing that because you don't do the same things as other people, that you are less valuable. That's not true. The word of God says the opposite. That each part of the body is equal. And it's telling you that consistently throughout scripture. Jesus doesn't go and he says, okay, well, I love these people more than these people than these people. Then oh, eventually we get there. No, no, no. Jesus just says he loves, he loves the children of God. Jews, Gentiles, slaves, free, prostitutes, tax collectors, Roman soldiers. It doesn't matter who you are. Jesus loves you. And, and so we need to understand this, that what I do for the kingdom is not more valuable than what you do for the kingdom. 
okay? Everything is important. I have the privilege of being able to preach, okay? It's, honestly, if you had told me as a teenager, I I would have laughed at you because it terrified me. But I was told to step out in faith. I've had great leaders in my life who didn't really ask me to do things. They just kind of told me to do things because they firmly believed in me that I could do them with God's help. They didn't trust in my own strength. They trusted that God would use me for the glory of the kingdom. By my count, we have 20 plus people in volunteers helping and leading in a variety of roles this morning. I'm not 20, 15, however many people. I'm just me. And every single role here is valuable. And I'm going to try to list off as many of them as I could think of off the top of my head. And if I miss one of the roles, I apologize greatly. But we we have worship the host role, greeters, the elevator operator, variety of children's ministries, the tellers, people that get the snacks and drinks ready in the morning, preparing the gifts for the guests, media, lights, sound, the ushers. And there's probably people that I've forgotten too that are doing volunteer work. And if I had to do everything, that would be impossible. Heck, if we get to the first item on the list, worship, we'd be doomed. I am so woefully underqualified to lead in worship. But there's no catch to this. There isn't a secret that I'm hiding from you. It comes down to a simple truth. We are all equal parts of the body of God. But it means that you need to do something. For some of us, that's that's easier than others. Um, When you look at the different service options there are probably many of them that you don't feel comfortable with. That's okay. It's okay to not feel comfortable with something. But I I would even say that not feeling comfortable with something is a good thing. My most rewarding moments in ministry are when I've had to step out in faith and trust that God will look after the details. In youth group over these past couple months, I've been teaching one lesson a month. Okay, we have four to five Wednesdays every month. That means the other leaders are teaching the lessons. Some of them are perfectly okay with that. It's it's right in their wheelhouse. They love to teach that kind of thing. Other people, not so much. Um, There's some people that I really had to talk into uh, leading a lesson. But you know what? They all did it. No one, like, lit on fire. No one get laughed off the stage down in the youth room. Everyone did an amazing job. Regardless of whether they were comfortable or uncomfortable. My first year at Crandall, uh, we did a course called, I, well, I did a course called Intro Praxis. And we do a praxis course each year in the theology program. And it, it's practical ministry. Um, and so I had six ministry placements. I did... I worked with drug rehabilitation, so we did homeless ministry, youth, children. Um, uh, I visited old folks in a nursing home, and we were going to do prison ministry, but the government didn't let us in that year, unfortunately. And part of that, we had to think about our theology of service. And that that may not be a way you've ever had to think of something before, but essentially it means, what do you believe that the Bible says about service? What do you believe that God says about service? And so, uh, children's and youth ministries have, has been my wheelhouse, well, since I was a, a youth. But those weren't actually the most impactful ministries for me. I went to the drug rehabilitation place. And there was two groups of people when we got there. We split up. One group went to talk with the people there and hang out with them and get to know them and pray with them. And another group went to cook a meal. Okay? My comfort zone is going to talk to people. I would much rather go and talk to the people than go and cook a meal. But that group filled up before my car arrived, so I ended up cooking. And the even scarier part was the group that was doing the cooking had less experience cooking than I did. So we made stir-fry, because you can't screw up stir-fry. But 
But for, for me, I, I spent the afternoon in the kitchen with another group of teenagers and young adults, and we chopped vegetables, we fried up meat, and then we served a meal. And that's not something I had ever really done before as a ministry. I'm usually out there talking with the people while they wait for the meal, while we wait for the meal to come. Or when we went to the old folks' home, this will really scare you, somehow we ended up with a group with no musical people. But we, they wanted to sing some hymns. And so me and another guy, through the Lord's grace, struggled through leading the group through hymns. Okay? When they hired me here, I told them the one thing I wouldn't do is lead worship. Okay? I told them I'd do anything else. Whatever else you want me to do, for good or for bad. But God's like, no, okay, Alexander, someone needs to do it. You're going to do it. Okay? Okay, God. And, and this kind of helped develop my theology of service. When, you, when we go back to that, that scripture in Luke, and we see that the, the disciples are sitting there in front of Jesus, arguing about who is the greatest. Could you imagine sitting there in front of Jesus and arguing about who is the greatest? Yeah, probably me too. But, and how, how discouraged Jesus might have felt in that moment. Because he knows that Judas is about to sell him off to the Pharisees. Peter's going to deny even knowing him. And then the rest of these guys seem to have, have missed the point of the whole thing. But you also see this beautiful picture in that. Because Jesus doesn't just like tell them to stop being foolish and sit down and listen. He, he tells them that, no, the, the greatest of you is going to be like the youngest. They're going to set an example in love. They're going to set an example in purity. The way they conduct themselves. And, and, and you see this thing, and what I what has come to be my theology of service, that you need to be willing to love in all situations and be willing to get absolutely nothing in return, which is hard. It's really hard to ask to get nothing in return. Because even usually with volunteering, at least you have some sense of like satisfaction, like I did a good thing. This went really well. But to be willing to love and get nothing out of it, that's what we see Jesus do over and over and over again. He continues to love these people who, who hate him. And so we're going to go on to our next point, though. And, and I'm willing to bet Jesus felt kind of discouraged in that moment. And that's one of the problems that we have, too. It's so easy to get burnt out on the things we do. It's so easy to get burnt out on the ministries, the volunteer work, because sometimes we, we, you, you, you will never see the results that you have. Um, so I'm going to get James to show a little video, and this is kind of where the lollipops come in. Um, and something my uncle showed me ages ago when I started uh, doing more leadership stuff, and something that he thought was important for me to know. And so I want you to watch this, and then we'll continue after. So I, I, I know he's a funny guy. But like he said, what might be the most impactful moment he's ever had in anyone's life, he doesn't even remember. Okay? And, and, and he, I know. I Trust me. I know how easy it is to get discouraged when you're just not seeing the fruits of your labor. When, when you wish that God would just be like, look here, look, look, look at the result of everything you've done. But that's not usually how it happens. Imagine the lollipop moments that this church has put into people's lives through things like Awana and the dinner theater and just even how the members of this congregation interact with the people around them. Okay? And, and I've had people tell me, well, Alexander, how in the world am I supposed to get one of these moments doing, doing media? I, I did media for seven years. So from the time I was in grade seven to the end of my time at UNB. Um, and I did it probably two times a month. So about half the week's um, for seven years, I, I, I did media. And about halfway through that, um, I got an email from the senior pastor one day. And it was a forward of another email who was someone had sent to him. And this young man had come to visit with some relatives. And his girlfriend had passed away. Um, and I had just arbitrarily picked the backgrounds for the songs. I wasn't given any direction. I just, oh, there was a pretty butterfly. It was springtime. I'm going to put that up as one of the song backgrounds. 
And that same picture was his background on his phone that his girlfriend had sent before she passed away. And you can call it a coincidence if you want. But for him, that, that was a moment of peace that he hadn't gotten since before she passed away. Okay? And if he hadn't taken the time to tell Peter, and Peter tell me, I never would have known. Never would have known the impact I had by arbitrarily picking a background one day. Maybe it was because we had to pray over the computer before service to keep it alive. But that, you, you never know how God will use you. And you probably, in a lot of ways, never will know the impact you have on people's lives. But as you go about your ministry and as part of the body of Christ, as you decide how to serve, remember to do it with love, to conduct yourselves well, and that the impact you have is far greater than you will ever see. I'd like to call the worship team back up um, as we go into our... Like ripples in a pond. I'm going to pray just before we go into worship. Dear God, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for these <coughs> wonderful people here, God. Um, it's such a blessing, Lord, to have such a group of people, Lord, who love you. God, as we search for leaders in this church, for a variety of things, Lord, um, Lord, weigh it on people's hearts, whether it's in their skill set or whether, Lord, it's something they're uncomfortable with. Give them the strength, Lord, and the courage to stand up and serve in those ways. To serve with the love, with good conduct, with purity, in a way, Lord, that we can honor you in the things that we do. Because, Lord, you see the impact that we have on the people's lives around us and the ways that we don't. And, Lord, just keep us encouraged, Lord, and at peace, Lord, knowing that through all things you can be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>